encouraged, guys. We are the light in the darkness. God has chosen you. I mean, this is amazing. He has chosen you to be the light today in this dark world. So, Father, we come before you that you are ultimately light, ultimately. And, and you share that light through us, God. At best, we are mirrors. <laughs> uh, we are just a reflection of the light. But, Father, we lift up this, great, this aunt who, who took in these boys that because it's family and it just I can't even imagine the crushing of her heart and for these boys whose life has been filled with disappointment abandoned by their parents and now this has happened so we pray for their peace wherever they are right now we pray they can be returned we pray for their safety God we pray all around us as to what's going on and what a great reminder that we are here today not because we're loved any more than anybody else but could it be that we're here today because God wants to recharge us to be a part of our world? Whether we're still working or in the next season of life, we are breathing. We have a mission. <laughs> so we thank you for that. So may your spirit come and fill us to overflowing portions again, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship our King.
All right, we're going to learn a new song this morning. Our God is strong in battle. Our God can never fail. Through him all chains are broken. Through him the sick are healed.
this morning. We shout glory, glory, glory unto you. You are deserving of all of our honor and all of our glory that we can give. So would you be lifted up in this place this morning? In spirit, would you be with us as we open your word? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, you can be seated today. Maybe greet someone around you that you don't recognize. Feel that way yourself? A little bit? <clears throat> oh, man. It's even hard to do that in public now. People think, oh, no, it doesn't have this. On. I'm just scoffing. Sorry. Uh, it is so good, really, to be with you. Thank you for praying for us as a... Uh, about once a month, uh, Rob and I will be up in Mount Shasta to help that church go through their transition. It's going to take a while. Uh, and uh, what's happening up there, for those of you that aren't, aren't aware, is their pastor passed away on June 5th as a COVID complication. His lungs just could not recover. And whenever I hear people say, you know, it's just a flu. No, it's not. Um, it's a, it's a far more serious than that. But um, And so we're helping them in the transition, okay? And uh his request of me before he passed was to help them move through this transition if he did not recover. And uh, he, he did not, but he is fully recovered today in heaven. I'm not saying that as a bumper sticker. It's true, and we're thankful for that. And so we're in that process. And my responsibility uh, is to, be, to find the couple. I don't hire them. I don't make the final decision. And then I introduce that couple to their leadership and help them go through the process. So this could take a while. And I, I told them, I said, better to go slow and, and than to go fast and make a mistake. Um, we're kind of hard to get out of the pulpit once we get in here, so I understand that. Uh, but uh, so thank you for praying. Thank you for letting us go to be a part of that. Aren't you thankful for the men and the leaders that are, are here that when we're gone, that it's not like a one-person show? I mean, um, I, I was so blessed last week by Pastor Rick, what he had to share uh, dealing with um, what, what Paul has talked about. So, so thank you for that. Uh, a couple other things. Ladies coming up at, at the beginning, uh, September 10th and 11th is the Her Ministry uh, sponsoring, uh, not sponsoring, that we're a part of the, the uh, Southern Oregon, Northern California Calvary Chapel Women's Conference. We're looking forward to that. It's not too early to register, by the way. Uh, you may want to go ahead and do that, ladies. And so it'll be a night of worship on Friday night. Uh, Sherry Young will be here again. She's an amazing worship leader. We've still been blessed by her over the years. And then also uh, all day Saturday, Saturday uh, we have Jean McClure, just a, an incredible woman of God. And so you'll be blessed by that. Also, uh, I might mention that I know that a lot of people went to the bookstore last week or tried to, but you couldn't get in. Uh, they're still, we're, we're kind of cleaning out the bookstore, all right? So anything in there, not people, but anything that you can touch that's for sale, 50% out of, okay? Just so, so those of you that want to do your early Christmas shopping with some biblical tools, that'd be a great place to go. It's not open right this second, okay? Just in between the services. I just want you to be aware of that. And men, we haven't forgot about you, all right? We've got some incredible things coming up in the month of uh, September. We have our, our annual uh, man camp, okay? Men don't have retreats. We always advance, ladies, okay? Uh, and so we'll have our man camp coming up. Uh, Bible study fellowship, we become uh, the host church for the men in our area. And this is a time for men throughout our whole region to come together and study the word together on Monday nights. And so that'll be starting up uh, in September. So there's a lot going on. And so just want you to be aware that we haven't forgot about you. Okay. If you have your Bible with you today, turn with me to the book of Titus, the book of Titus. And we're going to spend uh, just some, some final thoughts in this uh, today. And then next week, we'll be looking at the book of Philemon. All right. And so just want you to be aware of that. And then we're going to spend some time in the book of Job. Okay. Not job, but Job, all right? It's not Palms, it's Psalms. I'm just trying to help you out. It's not Malachi, it's Malachi. So you'll learn those things as you go through the Bible, okay? But um, as we come to the word today, really, it, it's kind of weird. I get emotional. Why? I just love God's word. I know you do do. And people say, what's your favorite book? Whatever book I'm in, that's my favorite book in the Bible. And, and, and we've been going through the Bible together. We started in Genesis and we do an Old Testament book and then we do a New Testament book, kind of marching forward. And, and we've spent the last several years reading from the pen of the Apostle Paul. You know, in this love letter, this is just one book, but it's filled with 66 other little books, okay? 39 of them are called the Old Testament. 27 of these books are called the New Testament, and, and of these 27 New Testament books, all right, 
You look at these and you realize that the Apostle Paul wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament. Some people say he wrote the book of Hebrews. I don't know. I know he enjoyed coffee, whoever wrote that. But the point is that, that Paul had an incredible influence on our lives. And, and as you go through his writings, you think, wow, this guy is amazing how God used him. And when you read his writings, they're really divided up in like three sections. Uh, he wrote a group of letters, nine letters, that, that these are what I call public letters, like to the church of Philippi, to the churches of Galatia. The, those are public letters. Then he wrote three, what we call pastoral letters, and we're looking at, at one of those three today, right to the pastor to encourage the leader. And then he wrote one personal letter to Philemon, which we'll look at next week. But you begin to see, what has God done? No doubt, as you, as you look at his writings, they're powerful, but if you read the Bible slowly, you also can pick up some amazing themes. And what I'd like to do today and Lord willing next Sunday is, is think in these thoughts. Here Paul is wrapping up. He's writing from prison, by the way. He's shackled by a Roman guard. Every six hours, a new guy comes in. You might say he had a captive audience, ha, ha, ha. But the point is, he's not writing from the Ritz-Carlton. He's not writing from luxury land. He's not writing from America where we have a lot of choices. He's under Roman rule. At the sneeze of a leader, your life could be over. At the cross look of a guard, you could be beat to death. Keep that in mind as you read his writings, that he was all about one thing in his life. It was Jesus Christ glorified. Let's never forget that. Yes, there's a lot of minutia in our world. That's the world we live in. But let's not lose our focus and lose our voice in the midst of all the weird stuff happening. And by the way, if you read the Bible, of all the people that should not be shocked on the planet... It ought to be us. We should not be like, wow. wow. It's not wonderful. If you think it's one, it's weird. You're weird. I don't like the thought of doing more funerals for people who have passed away from pestilence. I don't like that thought at all. But yet, God has chosen us to live in this day. He sees something in you you may not see. Don't miss that. God saw something in Paul that no one else saw. Paul didn't even see this about himself. And so as you come to the end of these letters we have in the Bible, there, there's two powerful themes I don't want you to miss. I think they're huge. Here's the first one I want us to look at today. That no doubt Paul was a man of passion. Boy, I hope the older I get, the more bright my fire burns. I mean, I, I hope that, I'm not trying to, show, I hope you see, I'm excited about this stuff. A lot of my friends are gearing down. They're buying new golf clubs getting like customized golf carts. I think that, that's really cool, but you know, but come on. Let's not forget our mission. Let's go out bright burning for the glory of God, amen? And so Paul was a man of incredible passion. No doubt as you see his life, you know, and, and, and as he had incredible passion, he didn't care who he was talking to. He took on the religious leaders of the day. In the, as you read in the Bible, these are called the circumcised. When you read the circumcised, they're talking about those men, those women who were religiously bent and they were passive. Paul would correct them when they got on the wrong course. Paul took on the apostle Peter face to face. He said, buddy, you're being a hypocrite. You know, here you are in Galatia. What a great opportunity to share Jesus. Yet you act one way when you're with your Jewish friends and you act another way when you're with your Gentile friends. Dude, that is wrong. I love that about his passion. Paul would also take on governors of Rome. Here he is, he's chained. He's in this huge, you know, outdoor theater in Caesarea. Seats over 15,000 people. He's standing in chains on the, on, on the platform and, and he's on trial. He says, Paul, do you have anything to say? He says, oh, Festus, you know exactly what I'm going to say. You know all about the Lord. And Festus, if you were being honest with yourself, you would want to be just like me except for these chains. This guy was full of passion. But what kept that passion going? Even he was authentic with the people living on the island of Crete 
where Titus was serving the Lord. Listen to what he says about them. In, in chapter one, we looked at this in greater detail, but I just want to remind you of this. In chapter one, beginning in verse 10, listen to what he has to say about the people living on the island of Crete. For there are many in subordinate, that means they're just stubborn, both idle talkers. I talked about this. They're like, you know, remember Kool Aid Night? But do nothing. Make a lot of noise, show a lot of power, but they don't go anywhere. Okay? There's a lot of these idle talkers and deceivers. Listen, especially those of the circumstances. There's a bunch of religious people popping off, but leading people nowhere, whose mouths must be stopped, who want to destroy whole families, teaching things which they ought not to teach. Why? For the sake of their personal gain. One of them. A prophet of their own, a, a guy actually about 700 years almost before Paul you know, arrived there. This guy was, I mean, this, his words were there for hundreds of years. He says this, he says, those people who live on the island of Crete, Cretans are always, did you hear that? Always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons who move to America one day. And they're like, excuse me. Um, <laughs> but the point is, godless people are godless people. Whether we're living in America, whether we're living in Crete, whether it doesn't matter. Godless people are the same all over the planet. And listen to what Paul says. This testimony, though it's 700 years old in his time, it's true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Paul did not back off. But what drove that passion? What drives my passion to share Jesus? What drives your passion to share Jesus? I think the beautiful pen of Paul, he nails it because we're all the same if we come to to true, sincere evaluation of who we are. Let's pick up today in verse 3 of chapter 3. Why was Paul so passionate? Why were his words so powerful? His presentations would not be forgotten. Beginning in verse 3 of chapter 3, right at time, he says, listen, for we ourselves were also once foolish. We were foolish. We, we were senseless. We were also disobedient. We were also deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. You know what Paul's passion was? He never forgot where he came from. He never forgot where he came from. May you never forget that first full day of grace when you understood it. The problem is we get saved and get over it. We get used to it. Wow. You see, what was Paul's past? And he wasn't ashamed. He didn't live in the past. But he wasn't ashamed to share, hey, listen, this is where I came from. If you want to, turn back in your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, a passage that we read often, we quote often. But when was the last time you read it slowly? Paul's writing to the, the leaders in Philippi. He says, hey, again, he says, you know what? And by the way, some of those are religious people that are wanting to mutilate Gentile men. I wish they were mutilated themselves. <laughs> so he just was not soft with the words. But he says, listen, I've never forgot where I... He says, verse 4, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone, if anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day. What does that mean? Every Jewish male was to be circumcised on the eighth day. He says, I was, I was that. Talk about my stock. I am from Israel. Talk about my stock in Israel. I am from the tribe of Benjamin. Why is that a big deal? Where was the first king of Israel from? Benjamin. 
I'm in the line of King Saul. My blood flows with royal blood, a royal heritage. I mean, well, he goes on to say this, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I've got it all according to the flesh. Now let's talk about this. There's my, my physical connection to this land and to our God. But what about my religious connection? Note this. Now concerning the law that, that makes us distinct on the planet in his day. I was a Pharisee. Because we're coming near the end of Paul's writing, we're not going to talk a lot for probably several years until we get back around again. A lot of things that he wrote about. He says, you know what? I was a Pharisee. That doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. You had Sadducees and Pharisees, okay? Two different religious groups. The, uh, the Sadducees were the ones that were more, we might call them the, the white-collar religious people. And the Pharisees are the blue-collar down to earth, but they were more, even more conservative than the white-collar folks, okay? And by the way, I was a Pharisee. In Paul's day, there were different connecting um, types of Pharisees, all right? Or basically, they had seven groups that they, they, they kind of connected with. And by the way, of these seven groups, five of them were really embarrassing groups to be a part of. If you read Matthew chapter 23, not right now, but you go back and read Matthew chapter, you'll see that Jesus, I believe, is attacking all five of the Pharisee groups that were dogs, so to speak. What kind of group? Well, there were these groups. There, there's one group they were called the, the, the shoulder Pharisee, okay? These are the, the Pharisees. They walk around... And they almost had like a lot of badges. They showed their good works on their shoulders. They made it really outward. This is who I am. This is how good I am. There were these types of Pharisees walking through the land. Then there was the, the wait a little Pharisee. And these guys never really made decisions. They made observations. And then after it was done, then they'd make their decision. <laughs> after things kind of went through, oh, there are these kind of guys. And, and then we had these, uh, what was they called? The blind Pharisees. Or often they were uh, called the, the bruise of the bleeding because they wanted to be so spiritual that they w- didn't want to be, you know, distracted by any temptations that they walked through town kind of keeping their eyes closed. And so that's why they were called the blind or the bruise, because they were literally bumping into people all the time. And then there was another group of Pharisees. They were called the, the humpbacked Pharisees, okay, or the pestle Pharisee, because they literally, they got a hump on their back because they walked around like this. Their eyes weren't closed, but they just wanted to look so humble. There were these guys. And then there was another group. They were called the, the ever-reckoning Pharisees. These are the guys that wanted to keep score so that they made sure God owed them. So whatever they did, they kept a record of this, and they were just kind of keeping score of how they were living their life. And then, those are the five that were kind of embarrassing. And then the kind of terms there was the, what's called the God-fearing Pharisee. We're going to be in the book of Job in a few weeks, Lord willing. And Job could have connected with these guys. These are the guys that all they thought about when it comes to God is, is how to please God without getting punished. So they were not really never in love with God, but they were fearing God in an unhealthy way. You know, trying to, to be reverent towards God, but also um, they, were, they were not wanting to break God's commands so they wouldn't go to hell. Did you hear what I just said? They were not wanting to break God's commands so they would not go to hell. What's wrong with that statement? We ought not want to break one of God's commands because we know it pleases him. And he gave those commands because he loves us, and those commands are best for us. Oh, there's a difference, yes. And then Paul could have fit into this last group. They were called the God-loving Pharisees. You know, they just, they're really pointed in the right direction. Um, Job may have been in that camp. Uh, no, he, no, he was more the God-fearing guy, I think about it. But Abraham could have been in that camp. Definitely Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, who was there at the end. And probably Paul, a guy named like Gamaliel, you know, so he's kind of a wait and see, but also this. So I say this because not every Pharisee was, was wrong. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to not everybody that works in the pharmaceutical industry is a horrible person. Are you hearing this? I have a niece. She's a biochemist. She's an incredible worship leader. 
She's committed her life. I talked to her a few months ago and a lot of the, the, the stuff. Would be, I said, sweetie, what do you think? Because everybody, she was just, well, here's my thoughts. But as she was sharing her thoughts, she says, but one thing you need to know, uncle, is my husband and I have made a commitment. We will never work for a pharmaceutical industry anymore that doesn't have the commitment to seeing an end to the result, not just put a Band-Aid on it. She's, you know, and she named, you know, I, I can't work anymore for companies that are just trying to relieve your headache, are just trying to relieve your back pain. She says, I, I, I've got these gifts from God. I've got to use them for the glory of God. So not every, by the way, not everybody in politics is a nut. <laughs> I'm serious. There's a lot of wonderful people that love this nation, that love our, our my niece, again, don't ask me about my nephews, they're losers, but my niece. No, I'm just kidding, I love my nephews. But, but listen, I got one niece, I mean, she's making inroads in the biochemistry. My other niece, and I get to see her in a couple of weeks, her first day in Washington, D.C., you ready for this? Was January 6th. <laughs> Unc, pray for me. And then we couldn't hear from her for 12 hours. She had to shut her phone off. Are you hearing? Not everybody is that way. So don't put us all in this little, mm. but there are some. Some of these Pharisees were whacked. And Paul says, that's where I came from. Look back at this. He says, listen, talk. And when I went for it, I went for it with passion. When I was a Pharisee, I was a powerful, passionate Pharisee. But then look at verse six of chapter three. He says, a Pharisee, a Pharisee concerning zeal. Here we go. I persecuted the church. Do you realize the first time you hear Saul's name in the Bible is in Acts chapter 7. And he's actually holding the coats of the men that are picking up stones to bash the head of Stephen. He goes, I was there. I was passionate. And then when he saw the result of that action, Acts chapter 8 opens up with these words beginning in verse 3. And as for Saul, after the coats were down and, 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 and Stephen's off the scene, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. That word havoc. How many of you here like to hunt wild boar or pig? A few people? Okay. It, it's okay. You live in Reading. You can raise your hand. We're not going to, you know... Listen, I don't do this, but my friends that do, and then the crazy ones that go out with a knife and a bow, these nuts, okay, they say, oh, it's really fun until, until that boar realizes it's you or him, and then they go nuts, those razor things coming out of their mouth, they're like, they just go crazy, they're tearing up the ground. That's what they're describing here. Saul went nuts with passion. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering, listen to this, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. It doesn't, by the way, it wasn't one day and done. As that, that violence grew, as that thirst for blood grew, that, that religious zeal grew, later on in chapter 9 the book of Acts, it says this, then Saul... Still breathing threats. Listen to this. Threats and murder. Did you hear this? He was a murderer. Against who? The disciples of the Lord. By the way, gang, you may not know this because we live in such an insulated world. Christians are the number one hunted for religious passions in all the world. Anti-Semitism is off the charts. Wow. But sometimes we get so busy about our business that we don't see what's happening in the world. About Gang, Why do I even mention those things? Because you ought to be passionate for Jesus. He says this. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. He says, I need letters. 
Let's make this a mandate. <laughs> I need letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. Says, I'm getting bored in Jerusalem. I want to go up to Damascus. There's more catch up there so that if he found any who were of the way, by the way, by the way, way, that's what we were called first. We were called Christians initially as a mock the word Christian means little Christ. They were mocking us. Now it's become kind of, yeah, I'm a Christian. But in the day, no, we were known as the people of the way. Why? Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and life. Oh, whether men or women, and he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. This was Paul's past. He never forgot it. Now back to Titus 3. He says, listen, this is what I know. This is what I know. For we ourselves also were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts, pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and what? Hating one another. He says, I was there. That was me. That's my past. I'll never forget it. Now look at the next verse. Verse 4. But, I like the God buts, don't you? I like God buts, I won't deny it. <laughs> but, when the kindness, when the kindness of the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared. Here's Paul living with passion, being passionate and all. He's going with passion. He's living his life because that was driving his life. And then one day it all changed. What? Remember on that way to Damascus? Let's go back there just for a moment to Acts chapter uh, 9. Picking up verse 3. He says, man, I got permission. I've got the letter. I, I can do it. Verse 3. And as he journeyed near Damascus... Suddenly, and I'm reading these words slowly and carefully on purpose because they connect to everything he writes to Titus. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, note this, who are you, Lord? That may surprise you. But there's a lot of religious people that don't know who the Lord is. Wow. Then the Lord said, I am. God, who should I tell Pharaoh? It? Uh, accept me. I am. From Moses to Jesus. I am Messiah. I am Yeshua. <laughs> I am Jesus who saves. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's got to be hard for you to kick against the, the goads. The, you know, like, like you're kicking into your, your spurs on the side. It's, it's digging into you instead of into the end. It's got to be tough. So he, trembling in his stomach, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Wow. Back to Titus chapter 3 for a moment. But, but when? But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. By the way, did you see something here about God's kindness and love? There are no limits. Amen. There are no limits. Look at uh, chapter 2 in Titus, verse 11. He said, th note this, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to some. Oh, good, you didn't buy your Bible. <laughs> Don't buy a broken Bible, buy a real one. It says to who? Amen. Oh, man. I mean, I see some of you guys. I can't believe it. You got saved you. Even in the back, <laughs> even in the glass room. He moves beyond the glass room into your life. I mean, think about this. Have you ever come into church and wanted to walk out because you saw someone you thought, why are they here? We're blessed with a lot of people in law enforcement in our church. And I'm proud of them. I, every man, every woman in law enforcement. We have men and women that serve in our, 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 well, that are lawyers. 
I'm proud of them. We often make jokes about them because they taught us the jokes, but <laughs> I'm proud of the men and the women that are willing to put their life on the lines. And then I'm proud to see what God has done with the rest of us that have been affected by them. But it's actually, he arrested me. No, you arrested yourself. You chose to go 80 in a 55. They're just helping you with your decision. And yet, it's got to be tough. And, and I've had officers tell me this. That's why I'm saying this. I said, Brian, it was tough on Sunday. Why? Here I put this bad guy in prison, fry or jail, Friday night. And I walk in and I'm sitting next to him on Sunday. Without Jesus, that would freak you out. But God's grace is extended to every single one of us. Can we thank the Lord for that? There are no limits. There are no limits. As a matter of fact, check this out. Because some of you still don't believe me. You're going, yeah, but you know how bad I am. Oh, you're right. I'm sure Jesus will go, oh, that's a bad dude. Peter, Paul, come look at that bad dude. Verse 14. By the way, Jesus Christ does this. Who gave himself for us that he might pay the bill. <laughs> that he might redeem us. Again, check this out. For what? Every lawless deed. Now, Miss Bad Dudette, you're not all that bad to God. You haven't gone too far. Can I say this? Stop today. Don't hurt me after this service. I'm fragile. <laughs> but the point is, gang, the enemy doesn't want you to hear that. He wants you to hear, Jesus came to, to help every lawless dude, but there's no but in this particular verse. And Paul, he never forgot that. And then you know what Paul tells us? Go back to chapter 3 of Titus, okay? Listen to verse 5. He says, and, and this work, when, 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 God, when God appeared in my life, I'll never forget this. Look at verse 5. And not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Paul's whole life up to that point in Damascus, I got to do the right things. I got to do the right things. I got to do the right things. And that got him no closer to heaven. Did you hear that? That did not cause God to love him any more, any less. He just kept busy. And I realized on that day, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but, now there is a good but again, but according to his mercy. Paul realized, God doesn't love me because of all the great work I do. As a matter of fact, God loves me so much he is not giving me what I really deserve. That's called mercy. Wow. But according to his mercy, he saved us. The word save, you, know, you, you born againers, you deliverers, what is, you know, you save people. It just means he delivered us. He took us from one place where we were headed and moved us to another place. <coughs> Excuse me. He saved us through the washing of rebirth. Regeneration just means rebirth. You know, when a baby comes out, what happens? You wash it up. It's just been born. Who washed us from rebirth. The first thing Paul remembers, is, then I experienced Jesus. It was the work of Jesus that changed my life. It wasn't my righteousness or, you know, trying to, to kill those that were going against our way. It wasn't, it was just God not giving me what I, He just loves me. Wow. And, and, and he does this in amazing ways. But then after experiencing Jesus, know what he experienced next. Oh, I love this part. I love it all, by the way. He says that a lot because I, I believe it. Not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration, or there's a new birth thing, and, note this, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly. By the way, you know, we all come in different camps when it comes to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. See the word abundant there? It means full measure. What does that mean? It means you don't get the Holy Spirit in portions. <laughs> When my wife married me, she got full measure. She got abundantly. 
Now, it was an incredible investment on her part. I probably gained 100 pounds since our wedding day. There's just more of me to love. That's the Holy Spirit. You're discovering he has a, you know, there's more of them. It's amazing. Whom he has poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Why is Jesus and the Holy Spirit so connected, so significant? Jesus, before he went to the cross, he was having a last meal. One of the joys about being a follower of Christ is you get a lot of food. <laughs> it's great being a Christian. We should call it big old fat Christian church instead of little country church. But <laughs> listen, John chapter 16, listen to this, verse 7. These are the words of Jesus. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. I've said this before, but I'm repeating myself a lot today, but hang in there. See the word helper there? It's a word in the Greek language that's pronounced parakletos. Now, this is not what that word means, but when I see parakletos, I see a pair of cleats. <laughs> that's not biblical, I'm just saying. But you know why I like that? As you look at this athletic body, honestly, that was a big part of my life, wearing a pair of cleats. Because those cleats helped me when I was playing football and I was on the line, those pair of cleats helped me to do my job to dig in, to, to pass protection. If it's a run, if it's a run, those pair of cleats helped me to dig in to get traction to go where I needed to go. Are you hearing this? It's the work of the Holy Spirit that helps you to dig in when it's time to dig in and go when it's time to go. And so Paul realized, wow. I'll never forget this, guys. I'll never forget this. Back to Titus. He goes on to say this. In this work of Jesus, this, this incredible Holy Spirit that he's placed within me, I'll never forget what happened. Verse 7. And having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Here's the mind blower. He goes, and then... After God's kindness and love show me it was for all men and there's no limits. And then you know what he did? He justified me. Justified me. I thought our sins were forgiven. Oh, they were better than forgiven. What's the difference between forgiveness and, and being justified? Well, forgiveness, yes, it's forgiven, but there's always that remembrance in the court of law, you can say, hey, you're forgiven. Go. You don't have to pay the fine. Go. You're, it's been forgiven you. But when the person sitting behind that desk said, no, here's justified, it's as if it never happened. Your past has been expunged. Your past has been acquitted. What does that mean? We don't remember that. I would like to justify some of the things my wife has done. I'm just happy if I can forgive them. But the reality is I can forgive her, but I can't seem to forget. <laughs> but God, when it comes to you and me and my past, it says we are justified. Amen. We often say that it's just as if I never did those things in God's eyes ever. Well, do you have any scripture to prove that? Hebrews, talked about that great coffee guy. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12 says this. God speaking. For I will be merciful to the unrighteous. And their sins and their what? Oh, we've heard that before. And their lawless deeds I will what? Remember no more. Why would Paul be so happy with this? He was writing to Timothy, another pastor. He wrote this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. He said, 
This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am what? Get behind me. I'm at the front of the line. I hope you understand now Paul's passion. To me, the ending themes, we're looking at this one today, and there's another one next week we'll look at, Lord willing. But here's the number one theme is Paul's bringing a conclusion. He says, I know where I have come from. May we never forget that. When you get all bent out of shape, and I do too, by the way. Remember, when I say you, there's three back at me. When we get all bent out of shape over political things, How long did it take Paul to change? A moment. The most powerful person on the planet can change in a moment. Here's something. Here's a question. I, I, that, when was the last time, honestly, when was the last time you said, God, would you bring an end to this COVID? Have you spent as much time praying for God to bring an end to it as you had putting your points of view out there? or preparing your arguments for why you have done or what you haven't done. Imagine what would happen if believers around the world came to the God who can end it and plead on behalf of God to bring an end to this instead of complaining and coercing and dividing us. Isn't the enemy having a great day? I was telling the church up at Mount Shasta, you know what the biggest church is in Mount Shasta? The church of Satan. What the biggest church in Reading is? The church of Satan. So why are we fighting with one another? Why are we picking on one another? These are brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, they have a weird bent, but so do we. I mean, have you ever thought about this? Maybe you're the weird cousin at Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh, I hadn't thought about that. So Paul says this. Let's end here, okay? He says this, verse 8 of chapter 3 of Titus. He says this is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Now let me explain what that means. First off, it doesn't mean that we work for our salvation. When Paul says, and this is not the first time he uses this phrase, good works, it means this. He's describing, we need to get back in the world. What's an illustration of good works? The Salvation Army. They didn't complain about how horrible it was in England. No, they took their faith and put it on the streets. It's these ministries, like I showed you at the beginning of the service, not for an illustration, but we go to Nepal because there's good works to do there for the glory of God. What Paul is saying is, yes, we're surrounded by a lot of junk, but get back into it. Get back into it. Don't just have holy huddles and think, wow, whew, I made it through another day without running into another non-believer. Hello? Hello? Guys, let's get back into it. This is the time. When was the last time? I'm, 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 I'm encouraged. This is encouraged. When was the last time that you brought somebody who doesn't know Jesus to come to church? I don't know. I, you know. I'll show you what. I'll tell my friends to go to another church to come with us. Then it's safe. What is that doing? Gang, if we were all the same church in town, then we all just be together. But there's different churches for different reasons. That's okay. Bless them, bless them, bless them. Hope they bless us. But the point is now is not the time to just hold on until Jesus returns. Let go, go for it. And never, never, never forget where we came from Amen. for his glory. Amen. Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for these words from the apostle Paul, his passion, wow. But God, thank you for what you can do in anybody's life as I look at my life. I'm not the worst, I'm not the best, I just, I am, I am. And maybe you walked in today, you're listening today, and you've really been influenced by your mind and by your actions, and you think, I'm that one exception that God cannot forgive. His kindness, his love cannot extend to me. 
what I've done with my life has limited God's ability to be God. Do you realize when you say that, you're talking to God who created all things? Who calls all the stars in the sky by number? Who knows how many grains of sand? And yet his thoughts towards you are more than counting grains of sand. Don't limit God. And I would say to you, my friend, you are not beyond the touch of God's grace and God's mercy. The only thing that's stopping that from taking place is your pride, your fear, and your faith. Not blind faith, but would you be willing to put your faith in this God that says, I can do it again in your life if you will allow me. And if that's you today, why not right where you're sitting, do that. Talk to him. Why not right where you're sitting today, simply just whether you're at home, driving down the road, sitting here in this building, why not simply do something like this? Oh, God. I need you. God, I've tried to work this life out in so many ways. I've been so wounded, so been so disappointed, been abandoned by my parents, kidnapped, sold into human trafficking. God, I need you. So God, right here in this place, right here in this moment, I want to say yes to you to come to my life, to give me new life again, like a being reborn today. And God, I don't want to be forgiven. I want to just be justified. All that stuff hasn't happened. And I need your Holy Spirit right now the full measure of your spirit to come into my life right now, right here, this day, this moment. So Jesus, here I am. And then just simply say to him, thank you. And then trust what he will do from this moment on. For some people, it's like Paul on the road. Wow. Sometimes he's done it and we've lived in such a rut, such a routine, we don't even see it for weeks, but people say, you know what? There's something different about your attitude. There's something different about you. And you realize, oh, wow. I was talking to this God a few weeks ago. He heard my prayer. Oh, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, for the rest of us, May we never forget. Yes, you can be people of passion. Paul definitely let people know where he stood with his government, with his religion. He let them know as a private citizen. He said, hey, listen, you put me in jail. I'm not coming out till you do it the proper way. There's a time to stand, stand strong, be powerful in your passionate protests. But don't forget where you came from. Pray for those who are mandating your life. Pray for those that are trying to manipulate your life. Pray they be changed like you were forever. Thank you, Father, for this day. May we stand, give our tithe and offerings towards you and worship and rejoice in this place. We love you. Amen. Let's stand together.
about the church in Crete, especially. We said a lot of uh, tough things. But Paul says, hey, listen, remember this. When you come together, may it be the older guys and the younger guys, the older gals and the young, you come together. Gang, this is what we try to do on Sunday morning. We want our, our high school students to be in with us. We want our, our Haven family to be with us on Sunday morning. But then we have opportunities throughout the week for the young adults. Come to our Haven service on Sunday. It's not a, a Haven church. and then the, No, we're one church. We have opportunities to come together in, in kind of people groups. In our high site, they meet together on Wednesday nights. We have Triumph, which is middle school. and um, they, they're, they're meeting together on Sundays and, and Wednesdays and the younger ones. But for the most part, man, we need to be a body coming together filled with different generations, worshiping the Lord, appreciating our generations. There's times to do that, but also honoring one another. I love having these men and women on the platform with us. This is fantastic. I, I love having you here. May it grow. May it grow. This is what God showed me uh, about four months ago. I know I'm going into overtime, but that's okay. Um, I, I was, I should have known this, but do you know, people usually don't come to church first to hear the under shepherd on the platform? It's true. When people walk in, you know what people do? We're sheep. We walk in, is there any other sheep like me here? That's just, that's just how we are. It's not wrong. Just, but I want them to see different sheep that just love sheep. Amen? We just love one another. We appreciate where your, where your little flock is at different age groups. I was there once. I used to have a flock of hair. You know, I know that. But let's just be people who are passionate about people. Amen? Hey, God bless you. Go enjoy the rest of your day. Share Jesus with someone this week. Thank you for being here. <laughs>